Welcome to this chapter on energy and atmosphere. This tutorial is going to walk you through uh, an overview of the context of the chapter, energy and atmosphere, as well as lead you into what we're doing for our manual, our project manual, and how to satisfy those criteria. So I wanted to show you this image to get kind of our integrative process approach as we look at energy. And energy it must be looked at holistically, uh, not only from a design perspective, but also again looking at our community, how we use energy, where energy sources come from, um, what the different effects of energy uh, on energy systems are from our own uh, activities and uses, our building practices, uh, and really the, the holistic picture of our community. So this image here uh, shows you uh, a concept for the future which is really looking at concepts of smart grids. So there's a couple different terms we're going to talk about. Uh, one is the smart grid. A smart grid is essentially a, uh, a system where all of our res uh, resources and uses of those res energy use uh, resources are linked to our uses and devices that use the energy. So it's linking the source and the output devices of energy so that we can meter and monitor our use and when we do that build electric systems on top of that electronic systems on top of that to help us manage our uses more efficiently. So a great example of that would be a um, our electric uh, power panel in our home, um, which when we use too much power, for example, we have surges. So when there are too many appliances plugged into a uh, um, an outlet uh, and too much energy running off of one circuit, we'll often blow that circuit, meaning it'll power, it'll shut itself off. Let us know that we've we've got too many uh, too much in, uh, too much electricity going on that circuit, and it'll shut itself off. So that same concept, uh, we can have a smart panel which not only just shuts itself off, but it tells us uh, we're using too much power. And we can tie that in with um, online apps or other, or other devices to help us realize that we're using too much power. So things like that. Um, and then those signals can go all the way back to the power company. And the power company can look at communities as a whole and they can get all this data and the computer can read all the use data, usage data and then calibrate how much power they're making to what's actually being used. So if we have a more efficient electrified system, we can then use our power more efficiently. Currently what happens is we have our energy plant, if you look in the distance here, our big energy plant there is producing power. Currently what we have is a power generation model where power is just being produced. Uh, for a predicted load, and that predicted load is a load that uh, imagines the, that everyone's maximizing their electric potential, meaning everyone's using as much electricity as they possibly can at a given moment, and we're all doing that across the board, and that's how much power is being produced to, to satisfy everyone's full power needs, potential power needs at the same time. And so that model is a model of redundancy, meaning they're producing excess power that does make its way back to the system if, if it's not being used, but it also we also see a lot of waste line loss uh, in the distribution system, the distribution network, where we just lose that power. It either goes into the ground and we lose it, um, uh, or it's much, or we... Um, or it's greatly decreased uh, along the line. So basically we either use it or lose it. And so that's an unsustainable model. With a smart grid, we'll be able to monitor this use, calibrate our generation, especially if we can tie in uh, electrified systems like non-renewables. So solar, wind, um, sources of power 
as well as hydroelectric power, uh, water generating power, uh, such as dams, uh, the more uh, non-renewable systems get online, then we have greater flexibility with how we control our energy. So that gives you kind of a, just an overview of where we're headed and how I want us to look at energy use. Uh, and we're going to then bring that all the way down into our building designs. And we're going to specifically look at what this means for our campus and some of the things that are going on on our campus uh, that we can tie into for the, specifically for the design criteria for this chapter, those design solutions for this chapter. One of the major challenges of smart grid is really just human coordination. And so one of your greatest skills as a designer is learning how to coordinate people to build projects that are integrative. So remembering back to our first lead chapter, our lead criteria on integrative processes, that's really the crux of it. So anything we want to solve that's at all complex, we need an interdisciplinary team, we need coordination, we need management, and we need to understand the full picture. And then as designers, we can bring all that into a clear diagram, such as using sketches, using diagrams, um, conducting workshops, etc. The way following the lead model uh, for a lead for a sustainable project, uh, we can apply to any solving any problem. And a smart grid is is a mega problem. It's a problem where it needs to be coordinated because simply because power is being used everywhere and it's a continuous cycle. So a few few things we need to get our head wrapped around where we are in the world in terms of our energy reserves. Um, how sustainable, uh, what are our sustainable opportunities, and what do we need to accomplish within a certain amount of time. One of the videos that I have posted for you is, is a, uh, a very brief discussion by the Dean of Design at the Uni University of Minnesota, Tom Fisher, Thomas Fisher. He uh, talks to you about uh, what's called fracture critical societies or fracture critical societies and our world is essentially fracture critical so I want you to watch his video uh, discussion and get a sense of what he means by we are in a fracture critical uh, world and he looks at different systems whether it's food population growth industrialization to even bridges that fail so our own infrastructure and the electric our electric, current electrical systems, uh, power generation systems, follow a very similar pattern that is fracture critical. And what I mean by that is we have a very old electrical system that basically is reliant upon fossil fuels, the use of coal, the use of uh, oil. And so those major sources of fuel, not only do they uh, produce a lot of carbon dioxide into the environment, raising global warming, and we'll look at the effects of that in a moment, but we don't have that many reserves left. And so if you look at this graph, this essentially follows the same model that Tom Fisher talks to you about in terms of a fracture critical, meaning our peak oil usage um, has peaked, meaning we've used our massive amounts of reserves, we've peaked our usage and we've peaked our ability to tap our own resources uh, somewhere around the year 2000. So now we're in 2015 and we are on the downward slope, meaning we are, the more we use, the less we have. And we, we're not, we're not, um, this is not a pretty picture, meaning we need to, we need to change our model drastically um, for our own survival. So another way to look at this is from, you know, in the previous model you can see from 1850 to 1950, within a span of 100 years, we've used uh, about 50% of our reserves. From the year 1950 to 2000, just a span of 50 years, we used a hundred, just, um, we used double our own reserves, um, but within a shorter amount of time. This is another way to look at this in terms of carbon dioxide emissions as well as fossil fuel reserves. 
from 1850 to 2000, we've used about 1,000 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide. We've emitted 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide. Um, in uh, 13 years, we've almost emitted about half of that again. So almost 500, by 2015, we'll have emitted five, about 500 gigatons. That's about half of what we used uh, from 1850 to 2000. And if you look at our carbon budget in terms of our how much we're raising the global climate uh, temperature, is we have about um, 85 years before we not only maximize all of our res we've used all of our reserves or known possible sources of energy again coal and uh, oil but uh, in 17 years we'll have raised the temperature uh, two degrees now this may not sound like a major uh, rise in temperature but it is so in 15 years, we're on track to reaching our carbon, half of our carbon budget, but we're also on track to raising the temperature, global temperature, two degrees. And what does that mean? So in 15 years, by 2030, we'll have raised the temperature um, two degrees from where it is today. Today, we've raised the temperature one and a half degrees. Um, we've raised the sea level by almost a meter, 0.85 meters. We are already seeing coral uh, in some areas of the ocean stop growing. So this is due to acidification of the oceans. We also are polluting the oceans in terms of putting more and more uh, plastics that break down and so we've got these micro molecules of plastics in our water. Um, and this is we don't even know the effects of that, but uh, that's kind of another discussion. But just in terms of raising the sea level due to melting polar ice caps um, due to global warming, uh, by 2030, we'll have, we'll, the sea level will have raised just over a meter. So Amsterdam, the city of Amsterdam, will be affected by that. Um, we'll have oceans being bleached, and every European summer will have a heat wave. Um, if we go back, uh, by 2030, we'll also have used another 725 of our own fossil fuel reserves. That's um, about just over half of our, of our known reserves. Um, and so by 2100, we're looking at a major, a major problem. Uh, the next wave is 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. And that will be a tipping point um, where the sea level will have risen 1.24 meters. New York City will be affected. Um, so all of Manhattan. Uh, our oceans will be dead. And Italy and Spain, Italy, Spain, and Greece will be desert. So in terms of when I say the ocean will be dead, the ocean will be completely uh, acidified. Um, parts of Europe will be desert. Um, and from there, we go to five to six degrees and we have one and a half meters of have risen the sea level bangkok's underwater um, we have double the ass one and a half times the acid in our oceans and the effects are unknown so this is what we mean by fracture critical meaning just a, a degree or a half a degree has drastic effects on uh, our planet and as you see, three, four, five degrees uh, is really, really unsustainable and really could mean extinction of our planet and of our human species. So uh, these are some other effects. Our corn crops, corn and wheat crops are already down 10%. Uh, we're looking at 20% by 2030. Um, much more heavy acid rain. 30% uh, of our species will be extinct by 2030 due to this issue. Um, and we really just, we're just at that point where these systems can fail very rapidly, very quickly.